Okay, well, first of all, very quick introduction. Uh, as, as you already know, my name is Chris King. I'm one of the PhD, I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham. John Carman is my supervisor and one of my colleagues in, one of my colleagues in the form of Phil. Um, today, within, my, within this presentation, I hope to show you a little bit of, of the study I've been doing into <laughs> battlefield landscapes and the relative significance of battlefield, of battlefield landscape features to given armies. But also, hopefully, trying to uh, broach the, excuse me, the broach the theoret so the theoretical idea that you, we should be looking at the distinct approaches to the utilization or not utilization of given landscape features within battlefields. So first of all, how do I decide? Uh, how does one decide to look at which at what features in the, in the conflict landscape? Uh, we know from this point there's been extensive. Um, vast analysis of features across different battlefields, different time periods. This is from a military history point of view, a conflict archaeology point of view, a military theory point of view. All of these different points of views effectively come forward to gather themes about how one either should or how what how we think people used the landscape when it came to battlefields. And these, these what what we got we got these all together, and eventually these these can then be analysed compared to the 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 information in the archaeological record. And compare to other sources as well. This, currently, from what I've been, not only from this conference but also from my other contacts as well, is there is an increasing um, interest in analysis across sites, so applying theoretical models, just not not to single sites, not to single <laughs> battlefields, but to battlefields within whole given time periods using armies of um, armies of a similar type. And in fact, this this I feel would be is, is a vital step within conflict archaeology. To be expand to be expand our horizons effectively. As I said, this presentation does illustrate finding from my own research. I should be handing in pretty soon. That's the aim. And um, as I said before as well, this does my research focus on how military forces in the past interact with the landscape around them, with specific focus on anything interesting, unusual, not logical, or strange in terms of why or how they use the landscape. So, how do you select the features? So a landscape feature, as far as I'm concerned within my own study, I've split into two different types of feature. You have uh, physical or natural features in the form of rivers, hills, forests, and then you have anthropogenic ones, ones that have been made by humans, settlements, roads, religious buildings, essentially the built landscape. Any one of these i found within my own existing research, any of these can have an effect on where the battlefield happens within the landscape. Um, however, as far as I'm concerned, and from what my own research has suggested, these are not necessarily universally applied, and these are not necessarily universally utilised either. Just because there happens to be a river and a hill and a forest does not mean that you're going to use all of them equally, and or any of them, in fact. And um, very, very, very brief outline of the tool set I'm using, Geographic Information Systems, GIS. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are relatively familiar, but to keep everyone on the same page, um, I'm using it as a tool for highlighting the spatial relationships between the battlefield and the landscape features, so effectively highlighting features within the landscape and therefore you can do spatial analyses on these features once they've been identified. How far are you from a given feature? Can you see a given feature? Can you see a feature from another feature? Any, anything like that can be done within the GIS space. It's done by layering data on top of the other, well, on top of, all the data on top of each other, effectively contextualizing data with additional data to make to answer to answer questions and again what I just said right what I do what I do within my study effective is I highlight the situations where a landscape feature is a prominent part of the battlefield and the reason I did this of course is to try and isolate the situations where it's more likely a landscape feature is going to be utilized so therefore it means that we can analyze excuse me you can better analyze how a force or how a or how a group of forces react to a landscape feature if you know that there's a prominent landscape feature on that battle site. So in this case with an extreme spatial relationship, either you're particularly close or you're particularly far from a given landscape feature. And this also means that once this uh, once this uh, has been what all these landscape features have been selected, I can then compare this relationship across different time periods using different battles. As well as using different um yeah different battles, different groups of people as well. And these individual examples come together to form case studies. Um, I will make at this point that the case studies you're about to see are also based on low resolution results from across all of the area of modern England and Wales as well. So I haven't just been doing this during my PhD. 
and um, it's essentially it's analysed special relationships are highlighted by the previous themes in in archaeology, in military history, in military theory, and so on. And in addition, I do actually visit these battlefields as well. I so said there's a lot of confused looks in the audience, so don't worry. I do actually go to these places, but the the reason why I do this it's to inform the data-led analysis with my own observations on the landscape and I think that's quite an important part to actually understand if you're trying to see from the point of view of those people who are fighting in the landscape utilizing the landscape try and see it from their own point of view so the for the for your um, for the purposes of this the, la the selected landscape feature I've chosen is from my research is a river I'm choosing the ones that are incredibly close to rivers and the two case studies I'm choosing is one which is the Battle of Blore Heath, which is from the Wars of the Roses within England. It's a battle from the 15th century. And the other one is from the uh, Civil War, or to call it, it's probably in the War of the Three Kingdoms uh, in the 17th century. So, very, very, so to go through these ones as an example, hopefully you give an idea of how I look at these battlefields and how the differences of how people approach landscape features is quite an important factor to be looking at within battlefield analysis. So, I said, well, what is this? The Lancastrians, i.e. the red ones, those guys there, they arrived first, they set up first, they waited for a good couple of hours while these, while these guys arrived. These are the Yorkists, another faction within the war. The river is this feature here, down the centre. It's quite steep-sided, it's a very prominent part of the battlefield. The Lancastrians were forced to cross the river as part of the battle, and the Lancastrians lost. That's an important part to point out at this point. So, from my own research, from the spatial analysis, what does it what does it suggest? First of all, that both armies have been visible to each other. Incidentally, I do have all the slides showing all these bits of data. I don't want to bore you silly. So, if you really want to see it later, I can show you all these bits all these um, bits of data I have with me now. Um, so, both armies will definitely be visible to each other. The Riviera is, river area is incredibly steep. This is taken not only from uh, the GIS experience, but also from my own experience of actually visiting the battlefield. It wouldn't be easy to cross by any stretch of the imagination. The modern road makes it considerably easier to cross this to cross this um, river feature, but it wasn't necessarily there at the time. While the entire area does slope towards the river, it is noticeably flatter, both from being there and within the GIS analysis as well, that it's flatter than the, surround, uh, the area that surrounds the battlefield as well. Also, the missile weapons, as we can tell from use by both sides, if we base them on the on the positions as shown in the map previously, the range of the missile weapons barely reaches the river. And also they didn't think about shooting it over the river either. And also that the armies did not nearly take up a large amount of space based on the currently estimated numbers and using my own analysis of estimating size within the battlefield area as well. And we thought the river definitely affected the movement through the battles for the battlefield. Right. So, in terms of the utilisation of the landscape feature and the interaction directly with it, the initial force Lancastrians seemed to move to the river as a defensive boundary initially. However, they were aiming to pursue the Yorkists, so they effectively hobbled themselves by turning up and standing on one side of the river. They sat there and let the Yorkists set up. The Yorkists um, were setting up for at least an hour, for as far as we tell from the eyewitness reports and from, their, and from other uh, secondary source material as well. So. They didn't cross the river, they left them to fortify their position, they left them to sort of set everything up. And effectively what the Lancastrians did by, if they selected that landscape feature, they gave the benefit to their enemy. Um, also the Yorkists didn't bother using any, any missile weapons, that because we know they had access to primitive artillery and arrows, lots of them. They didn't use them at all until the Lancastrians were already crossing the river. So we can definitely say that there was an extreme relationship. That this feature had an extreme relationship with the battlefield was utilised by one or more of the forces. Definitely, however, the means at which it was utilised, I cannot. I would definitely say at this point, it's not necessarily a logical way. There's no. Um, there is, there's nothing. But there's nothing. In, in all the research I've seen, there's nothing to suggest that one would turn up to a battlefield, put yourself on the other side of the river, and then so oh. Oh, flip that! We have to go jump over the river to chase our enemy. So there's no. There's no logic there at all. Um, this, of course, was made partially worse by the insistence of the Lancastrians to use cavalry to attack across the river first. Um, yes, I've been there. Cavalry would not like that river. Um, also, it demonstrates, as far as I'm concerned, the importance of analysing the battle from the perspective of those who fought there. There must have been a reason why this, was, uh, why this seemed like the right idea at the time. Or, maybe no one thought about it at all. Maybe this was just, they're on the other side, they're just over there. We'll ignore the river, is no, there was no obstacle to us. Either way, this is a vital part that you have to consider when looking at battlefields. Going through my other 
Example, the Battle of Langport. This is from the Civil War, the War of the Three Kingdoms. The Royalists, this force here, arrived first and fortified the river. The Parliamentarians, the significantly larger blob, arrived second. Okay. And the river, the river, as you see, runs through the, the centre of the battlefield. The Parliamentarians tapped across the river and the Parliamentarians won. What can my research say about this? Again, both armies were visible. The river area is accessible across most of its length. It's not very steep. Um, so anyone could have jumped across the river. And also the ranged weapons could easily have fired across the river. However, the majority of weapons could only hit from the starting positions. The space of the Iron Tower is very large, only just fitting inside the registered battlefield area suggested by the Battlefield Trust and Historic England. Oops. There we go. I've done what I said there. Oh, apparently that's all my research says, which is wrong. Um... <laughs> Well, what the rest of, what the rest of the slide would say uh, is that the <laughs> it's effectively that even though yes, well I can go with this one. Even though they seem to move the river as a defensive boundary initially, despite having large amounts of artillery on both sides, and we know the parliamentarians definitely had an advantage of artillery because they were able to fire on the uh, parliamentarian positions, they still insisted on going across the river and uh, force and forcing their way across the other side of the river with cavalry again. So obviously there's very much a so very much a drive to use cavalry, even though cavalry is not necessarily needed. Thus we can say this feature had an extreme relationship with the battlefield. It's utilized one more forces. The force did utilize this landscape feature in a very logical way. However, well it's a very logical way, in a logical way. However, still with this in mind, cavalry still played a major role in taking the river crossing, even though it wasn't needed. And it highlights that even when forces apply widely accepted logic to utilization of landscape features, there are still elements distinct of the time period. Why would, what's the point of all this? What advantage does this give? It highlights the, the need to understand the given period's distinct approach to warfare, distinct approach to seeing the landscape and utilizing troops within that landscape. Not just because of technology, not just because of access to different troop types, but also because mentality and approach to warfare can be different and understanding that that is, a, that is the case. Um, there is a current trend within, conflict, uh, within, within the studies of conflict is to focus on individual, individual studies within individual battlefields. It's by no means a universal trend, but it is quite a, lot, a large trend. And it effectively tries to pull that apart slightly and spread that to different conflict sites. To different conflict sites and across, um, across a whole time period if possible. Also, understanding... The, and also noting that the approach to the use of the landscape feature, at least, at least within these two case studies, does, does appear to be different, which suggests, therefore, that the approaches to the utilisation or not utilisation of landscape features between different time periods and between different uh, uh, between different groups of people does change. Whether that's whether that's because of you know the weather, the sun, the fact that one of them prayed that morning and one of them didn't, we don't we don't know. But it's important to remember, important to take that into account when looking at a battlefield, and it's important to then incorporate that into the understanding of the narrative. Also, for example, as shown by my uh, colleague um, Ellie's presentation, it's also useful when applied to battles we know little about them. Because we don't know necessarily the... Um, we don't know anything about what, what, their, uh, what the opportunities they had to take at certain parts of the battlefield, whether they saw some parts of the battlefield be more defensive or not. But utilising this um, data-led approach combined with other... Uh, combined with other disciplines and with other approaches as well is very important to trying to understand the full narrative even simply knowing just how much room soldiers take up on the battlefield which I've done through my own research both in my masters and in my PhD in terms of looking at that it's even just that little thing it's quite important understanding just how they saw the landscape so don't worry, I'm wrapping it up don't worry about it. <laughs> um, what can we say what can we say about this and what do you think it adds to it so this study Finds that, so essentially it adds to the field of conflict studies by providing empirical data on elements within the conflict landscape. I choose to interpret the, this data based on my own knowledge and my own research. The data that can be provided by this approach and by the approaches like it um, is, entirely, is entirely empirical. So we can interpret from it what we can, but it's important to take this nonetheless take it into account. This can lead to better interpretation on the actions within a given battle and also forces how forces interacted with the wider conflict landscape. This is not only features, but potentially also roads, other forces, other features in the landscape that may not have been considered part of the battle, such as religious buildings, or the, a, a settlement being within three miles of you, something we would not normally consider to be part of the battlefield space, but nonetheless will be taken into account by those taking part. 
And studying areas such as this highlights the links between conflict and the inherent social societal groups involved, because fundamentally we are dealing with people. We are not dealing with people, we're not dealing with um, just agents within a simulation who, who fundamentally are controlled and programmed by us. These are people with their own thoughts, feelings, um, phobia of hills, you never know. So thank you, thank you very much and special thanks of course to John as my supervisor and Phil for having run this with me. Thank you very much.